As we learn uh, more about the benefits of psychedelic agents, we, we find that the available materials also have important limitations. And at the Alexander Shulgin Research Institute, we see these limitations as opportunities to create new compounds that have improved adverse effect and side effect profiles, um, as well as improved ease of use, but yet which still deliver a satisfying and full spectrum uh, psychedelic experience. We use uh, the re analysis of structure, uh, chemical structure to biological activity to help us guide the development of new compounds. Um, in, in particular, uh, we'd like to avoid certain what we call off-target receptors in biological binding sites. You've heard about the serotonin 2B receptor several times over the past few days, and this receptor is on heart valves, and chronic activation of this receptor can lead to a, a cardiac valve disease. It causes a tissue proliferation and interferes with, with valve function. So that's one of the things that we want to do is avoid activity at that receptor. Uh, pharmacokinetics uh, comprises duration of action, um, route of administration, and metabolism, among others. I once asked Steve Ross, Dr. Steve Ross, why they selected psilocybin instead of LSD, and this just came up in the last um, presentation uh, series. Uh, and he said, well, we want to go home at night and have dinner with our families. And I thought, well, that, that, that's good. And so that kind of, in the, in the clinic, while well, a long experience may be perfectly acceptable for a, a weekend retreat or an all-night medicine circle, I think clinical use uh, favors uh, maybe a two to three hour duration of action. We want orally active compounds. Most drugs are administered orally, and this is the most agreeable route for both clinicians and patients. But this kind of takes the very impressive psychedelic DMT off of the table, which is inactive orally unless one takes other steps, such as administering a monoamine oxidase inhibitor uh, with, with the compound to render it orally active. Uh, empathogens are noted for their sympathomimetic effects, so drugs like MDMA cause the release of serotonin, but also dopamine and norepinephrine, and this can produce uh, tachycardia, elevated blood pressure, uh, even serotonin syndrome in, in rare cases. Uh, gastrointestinal effects such as nausea and vomiting are characteristic of uh, substances like ayahuasca or peyote, and even uh, synthetic and pure psilocybin can produce this, as we've seen earlier. Drug-drug and drug-food interactions can occur with any class uh, of psychedelic compounds, and we'd want to avoid those. And post-session depression has been reported with MDMA, and we heard about that even earlier this morning uh, in the uh, first set of presentations. So what I'd like to do now is, is share with you some of the things that we've been working on at ASRI to address some of these concerns. Uh, we've been creating new compounds and trying to improve the uh, adverse effect profile and some of these other um, uh, considerations. So this uh, slide shows, and, and, and I thank Emmanuel and Elias for showing all the chemical structures because I have a lot of chemical structures and you know nobody ran out of the room when they saw benzene rings, so I'm, I, I'm, I'm happy to share these with you. And, and so again, thanks Emmanuel and Elias. But uh, so this is DMT. Uh, and it's uh, converted by monoamine oxidase and aldehyde dehydrogenase 
to indole-3-acetic acid. So DMT is metabolized when taken orally to this inert compound. This was first described by Steven Zara in the late 1950s. He was a Hungarian scientist who discovered that DMT uh, was a psychedelic compound. And then more recently, uh, Jordi Riba, uh, the late Jordi Riba in Spain, uh, showed that 97% of an orally administered dose of DMT gets converted to the uh, indole-3-acetic acid. And so there are ways to prevent this, uh, as I mentioned, uh, you can take a monoamine oxidase inhibitor. Uh, so in, in ayahuasca, the harmala alkaloids serve this function. But another way to do that is to change the uh, chemical groups that are attached to the nitrogen atom here, because this is what gets clipped off. And so a number of these have been made over the years, dipropyl tryptamine, uh, diisopropyl tryptamine, uh, and others. Uh, one of uh, Sasha Shulgin's last projects was the creation of uh, of modifying these groups, uh, replacing them with allyl groups. So he produced diallyl tryptamine or DALT, and these are allyl groups, and 5-methoxy DALT. Uh, so it's a, a methoxy group here and the two allyl groups. And this renders these compounds orally active now, so they're not, they're, they're, they're resistant to monoamine oxidase. And these, these are in fact psychoactive, but they have rather unremarkable uh, psychedelic effects. They're kind of just kind of generic intoxicants, if you will. Uh, so we sought to improve uh, the DALT compounds by making some modifications. And so some of the compounds we've produced are shown here. So it's these two compounds on the right side of the slide. And I just showed them in comparison to the DALT compounds uh, that Sasha Shulgin invented. We screen these compounds at 51 biological sites, receptors, enzymes, uh, ion channels, et cetera. I've only sh showing two of the values here. So the, uh, what we see here are the affinities uh, for the serotonin 2A receptor and the serotonin 2B receptor the receptor we want to avoid, basically. And what you should know is the lower the number, the higher the affinity. So a large number uh, at, at one of the receptors means the affinity is weaker than, than it would be if it were a smaller number. So we can see with the, with the original DALT compounds, they're really not selective for the 2A receptor. They're actually selective for the 2B receptor, which we don't, we don't want. Um, there, and so what we did is we made some modifications. We took the three carbon, one of the three carbon um, allele groups, so there's one, two, three carbons, and replaced it with an isopropyl group. So these are asymmetric allyl tryptamines. And what you can see here is that we've kind of basically flipped the selectivity. So now these compounds, notice that the lowest number is at the 2A receptor, not the 2B receptor. So we've kind of flipped these from being 2B selective to 2A selective. And early reports suggest that the 5-methoxy IPALT has a very rapid onset of action, about a two-hour duration, and agreeable uh, psychedelic effects. Another way to modify the uh, metabolism of a compound is to replace some of the hydrogens with halogens, in this case fluorine. So fluorine has a property of drawing electrons to it. And what the fluorine does in this position here, so we replace one of the hydrogens with a fluorine, is it weakens the bond between the nitrogen and the carbon. It weakens that bond and it also makes the drug more membrane soluble more, it can easily traverse cell membranes. And so uh, what we would predict is that this compound would be metabolized more quickly so we can kind of create a shorter acting compound if this is borne out. And so what we did is we looked at these two compounds and we incubated them with human liver microsomes. So this is human liver tissue that contains all the metabolic enzymes. 
And so the, what you see in the green line is MDEA itself, an empathogen uh, with an ethyl group. And then the new compound we created were one of the hydrogens that's been replaced with that fluorine. And we see that the, so the green line is the loss of the parent compound starting at 100% at time zero, and over an hour, it, it's disappearing as it gets metabolized. And you can see that the fluorinated compound uh, is metabolized more quickly as we hypothesized it would be. And so we've essentially uh, tripled the me metabolic rate of this compound using this strategy. Uh, another way to change the metabolism of a compound, sometimes, sometimes you may want to uh, uh, increase the uh, presence of a parent compound. That is, instead of making it be metabolized more quickly, you might want to slow down the metabolism, and such is the case with MDMA. Roughly 5 to 15 percent of MDMA is metabolized via liver enzymes to MDA. This is an active drug, but it's an even more potent releaser of serotonin than MDMA itself. It's a more potent depleter of serotonin than MDMA itself, and it causes more of a sympathomimetic cardiovascular push. So what we, what we would seek to do is to decrease this metabolic process. And so one way that you can do that is to replace the hydrogens, one or all of them, with deuterium. This is a strategy being used by several other companies in this space, uh, in particular with psilocybin, uh, deuterated psilocybin analogs. Um, it was first kind of um, spearheaded by Teva Pharmaceuticals, who created uh, dutetrabenazine, a drug used to treat Huntington's, uh, Korea, and tardive dyskinesia. And by creating this deuterated form, they were able to double the half-life of the parent drug and uh, also re re reduce the size of the dose required. And that, that follows from reducing the metabolism. So deuterium is just a hydrogen atom, but it has a neutron in the nucleus. And so what this does is it just doubles the mass of the atom, of the hydrogen atom. It be behaves chemically identically, but it's just heavier. And so what that does is it slows down the rate of removal of, of deuterated compounds uh, by the, the enzymes. They're kind of harder to take off because they're heavier. And so we created a deuterated form of MDMA. We call this MDMA D3, where we replace the three protons on the methyl group with deuterium. Uh, so these are the protons that have been replaced with deuterium. And when we expose these to uh, uh, the human liver tissue, uh, we see that the half-life has been almost doubled. So this kind of achieved our goal as well. So I'm going to leave it there. I've shown you four new compounds. Uh, I want to acknowledge uh, my co-workers, uh, Dr. Paul Daly, who's here. Uh, Wyeth Calloway is our uh, lead uh, organic chemist at ASRI. Uh, Mark Martini is a lab technician slash junior chemist. And then uh, the late uh, Tom Thomas Zabo, who was one of our early chemists and uh, passed away unexpectedly in early August, but contributed significantly to the uh, MDMA D3 work. So that's it. My time is up. Thank you. Is that Callaway related to Jace Callaway or no? Different Callaway. Um, here to join us on the Horizon stage is Dr. Kurt Rasmussen, who is a chief scientific officer at Delix Therapeutics, a neuroscience company developing novel disease modifying therapeutics for psychiatric and neurological conditions. Dr. Rasmussen joins Delix from the National Institute of Health, where he led NIDA's Division of Therapeutics and Medical Consequences since 2018. Please welcome Dr. Rasmussen. Uh, 
Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for their kind invitation to speak today. And I'm not going to show any chemical structures. <laughs> Maybe that'll be a relief. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. My work here is done. Um, <clears throat> what I'd like to share with you is my perspective on the development of psychedelics and potentially non-hallucinogenic derivatives of these compounds for the treatment of, wide tra the, uh, treatment of a wide variety of neuropsychiatric disorders. We've heard about some of them, depression, PTSD, and now substance use disorder, potentially even OCD, how exciting, and, and, and headache as well. Very exciting. Uh, I was drawn to the study of psychedelics long ago because of the profound effects of these compounds on sensory processing, thought, and behavior, and the complete mystery with how these uh, compounds were doing so. Um, <clears throat> early on, it was really completely unknown how they worked in the brain. I worked on this mystery for a while, and it was exciting to see the activation of the serotonergic 2A receptor, which you've heard a little bit about today, emerge as critically important for the effects, the, the hallucinogenic effects. Ironically, I spent most of my career in big pharma trying to develop medications that avoided activating the 2A receptor. And so it's really fun to, at the end of my career to return to to make the study compounds that are activated to a receptor, we didn't know that that could be such a, a wonderful source of therapeutics. Uh, the rapid and long-lasting therapeutic effects of these compounds are not quite a cure, but a definite step in that direction. Uh, and I can say without hyperbole that these compounds represent nothing less than a revolution in the treatment of neuropsychiatric disorders. And if they're proven to be as effective as they seem, it will change patient care forever. I must point out, however, that with the promise of these compounds comes some limitations. One of the important challenges facing the psychedelics is the limited patient population that can access them. Not everyone will be able or willing to take psychedelic-based medicines. For example, uh, psychedelics will likely be contraindicated for patients with psychotic symptoms including schizophrenia, or even a family history of psychosis. In fact, this type of patient is, is being completely excluded from all the clinical trials today, with good reason. Uh, also, patients with Alzheimer's disease or other types of dementia may have uh, strong negative reactions to hallucinations. And I heard, I listened with great interest to my colleague from Hopkins, who's, who's uh, looking into Alzheimer's. But I did notice there was the mild MCI in early AD uh, it'll be interesting to see how those patients uh, respond, but later, later a, a more fur further developed dementia may be uh, problematic. Uh, in addition, other patients will oppose taking psychedelics on moral, personal, or religious reasons and will just out flat refuse to take them. And I can imagine someone saying, you know, I don't care what you say, doc, I ain't taking that. Uh, Another potential problem is the heightened state of patient vulnerability during the trip. And layered on all this are questions surrounding whether psychedelic medications will be reimbursable. So there's a new type of medication, or what might be called a third generation of psychedelics is emerging that might be able to address some of these concerns. By modifying the chemical structure of the psychedelics, starting with the psychedelic structures, which you just saw a few of them, in modifying them slightly, uh, Dr. David Olson has discovered compounds that, at least in animals, maintain the efficacy, but seem to lose the propensity to produce hallucinations. Again, as best we can measure in animals. We'll never know for sure until we give it to people, of course. But it's looking like an intriguing possibility that uh, they're as effective in the animal models for the efficacy, but don't seem, to, don't seem like they will be producing hallucinations. And, you know, our company was formed several years ago to try to get pay compounds like this into patients. And uh, to be a bit flippant, in a way, we're taking the fun out of fungi. Sorry, I couldn't resist. <laughs> uh, but how can a compound maintain the thera therapeutic benefit but not produce the hallucinations? Well, we believe and have data to show that the therapeutic efficacy and the hallucinations are likely produced in different circuits in the brain. And these effects can be differentiated. Our teams discovered multiple types of hallucinogenic drugs, in addition to the classic psychedelics, including the disassociative anesthetic ketamine, have a common effect on neuroplasticity in the brain. 
these compounds actually physically change the shape and connections of specific neurons in the brain for an extended period of time. This is why we, we consider this, or I consider, one step closer to, to a cure, not quite a cure, but changing the brain, healing, if you will, ac actually repair some of the damaged neurons. Uh, this common effect on change in neuroplasticity, uh, we've, we call it, we term psychoplastogen, psychoplastogen effect, and um, we hopefully won't have to wait too long to find out whether or not these compounds that, we'll find out whether or not they're hallucinogenic, and we'll find out, and they're effective, hopefully we'll be in, in the clinic within a year. Uh, so these new third generation compounds have potential to treat many types of neuropsychiatric disorders without producing hallucinations, uh, and thus we'll be able to reach more patients than the psychedelics. Uh, these compounds, as you can imagine, have deepened the debate around whether the hallucinogenic experience is necessary for the therapeutic effects of psychedelics. And as you can imagine, there are proponents on each side of this debate. Uh, many have claimed that the hallucinogenic experience, ego dissolution, and the like, uh, and the insights gained are critical to the therapeutic effect. And for some, this may indeed be true. However, the hypothesis that the related non-hallucinogenic compounds can have the same therapeutic effects is an empirical question and can be tested. Uh, are the hallucin hallucinations needed? I don't know for sure, but it's a viable hypothesis, a real hypothesis. They are not required. We'll find out soon. Uh, while this hypothesis has ignited fervent debate, it's important to state that it's not an either-or issue, it's an and issue. Uh, we're working hard to develop these compounds that do not produce hallucinations, but we're simultaneously rooting on the development of the psychedelic drugs, because the world needs better treatment for the millions of patients suffering from neuropsychiatric disorders. The more treatment options, the better. And while we're developing what we hope are non-hallucinogenic psychoplastogens, we hope that the hallucinogenic compounds prove efficacious and safe. There's more than enough room for both types of compounds. In fact, I can see a day when different patients with different disorders or even different symptoms in the same disorder can be treated with either hallucinogenic or non-hallucinogenic psychoplastogens, these compounds that change the neuroplasticity. Maybe even the same patient, patient will receive one type of compound at a different stage of the illness. For example, um, maybe a hallucinogenic psychoplastogen like psilocybin could be used to kickstart the treatment. And then, if you notice, m many of the effects fade over time. Maybe a non-hallucinogenic psychoplastogen could be used to maintain that response. However, it's almost certain that non-hallucinogenic compounds will be needed for the treatment of schizophrenia and dementia. And it will take years of careful clinical research to get to the point where we have these treatments options sorted and can then tailor treatments to individual patients. In the end, patients will benefit from more treatment options and isn't what, that what we all want? Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Dr. Rasmussen. I was just thinking what a funny sort of sweatshirt it would be, like Delix, taking the fun out of fungi. <laughs> um, it's a great, it's a great, I'm gonna quote you on that one. Uh, Jacob Baker, who has been really great about keeping the Slido full of questions, is asking Dr. Cozy if he thinks that the subjective effects of psychedelics are necessary for the therapeutic effects. I, I believe that, um, I don't know if they're necessary, uh, you know, pursuant to, to, to Kurt's comments, but I, I believe the visionary experience is transformative, and I, I believe that, uh, you know, the, the, the powerful visions, uh, the mystical experience is, is part of the healing process. So, you know, uh, I, I've thought about the the analogy with, and, and I'm aware of you know the movement to create you know non hallucinogenic, and it, it's interesting that there might be different circuits, but 
It's kind of like drinking flat beer, you know, or... Uh, uh, <laughs> or maybe non-alcoholic beer, like some people don't quite see what the point is. Um, but, I, but I also do really agree with Dr. Rasmussen that, that there, is, there are going to be situations where people don't want to trip, and they want to avail themselves of the anti-inflammatory effects or the... The neuroplasticity effects, but they don't necessarily. Um, I don't like to use the word hallucin hallucination or hallucinogen. You know, I I tweeted a few months ago, like, what is, what is so hallucinatory about peace, love, and understanding? Like, I think uh, some of the some of the visions and some of the messages that we get from psychedelics to me are sort of like ultimate truth, not you know fake. Um, but I, but I do sympathize. I do, I can understand that there are some people, like you said, like Doc. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to take that. And uh, and there, I'm assuming that there is, there is room for everyone, and it's a big tent. Yeah, and it may be, it may depend on the indication. Uh, like we heard earlier, the migraine, there was not a correlation with the uh, the psychosis, the uh, hallucinogenic effect. And so it may be very much a, a parse process of the indication. Maybe in depression, that's necessary. Migraine, maybe not, or maybe less so. And there'll probably be different patients on the spectrum that some, some patients will need a little bit more of that, some maybe a little bit less. Um, Dr. Rasmussen, you commented on schizophrenia being a contraindication. What are your thoughts on the study mentioned with it being an indication? So uh, we were talking about this, uh, a study that is not yet underway but is being planned uh, with MDMA-assisted therapy for schizophrenia. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, uh, MDMA was probably different from psilocybin. Um, they'll need to, so it may not induce the floor increase in symptoms like a psilocybin. MDMA may not be quite as bad like that, but it'll just have to tread carefully. Uh, this, this is a patient population, a lot of individual variability. Hopefully they get some help, but uh, we have to be ready to back off in case it is problematic. Yeah, I think the idea was to start with patients who have more like predominantly negative symptoms. Yeah, great. And there there One, is a history of using right. amphetamine with patients with negative symptoms. Agreed. Didn't, and we're lumping patients figure. all together too much. Each patient has its own, his own, her, her her own symptoms. Uh, question for Dr. Cozy, are the receptor affinity assays conducted on animal or human receptors? Is yeah, there, 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 there are uh, cloned human receptors uh, grown in vitro. Uh, there's cell lines that are stably expressing the receptors. Uh, you know, the caveat are these are just basic binding values and they don't necessarily predict whether a substance will be active in a, in a human. There are many barriers that a, a drug must pass before you know, reaching the brain. So th with that caveat. And then another question about whether 2B agonists are uh, psychedelic or not. Well, the consensus is that the 2A receptor is required, but we, we know that there are at least 40 different receptors that psychedelics uh, uh, bind to, and to the extent that some of these others contribute to the effect, I, I kind of feel that the um, different, the qualitative differences among psychedelics might be uh, explainable by, you know, having the 2A receptor, but having different degrees of activity at the other receptors. And 2C is also involved here yeah, as well. Yeah, you mentioned yeah. 2C. It's like, no, you know, what, nobody seems to remember yes. 2C. <laughs> it, it don't get no respect. It turns no, out to be a really big deal. It doesn't get enough respect. Um, I want to remind you all, even though we're going to have a little break at 4 o'clock, that uh, we have got a great panel at 4.30, and then after that panel, we are watching a video from Roland Griffiths, and then we are going to have the grand Q&A, so feel free to get your Slido happening. Uh, so quick break, and we're starting promptly at 4.30. You might want to aim for 4.20. Uh, right, 4.20. <laughs> 